Okay, can everybody hear me in Zoom land? I hope. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, can I assuming everybody can hear me and see the screen that you know we're looking at? Uh, I'm going to start with the endocrine system. A few things about the class. This is AMP two. Uh, the syllabus is listed in um, uh, e the e-learning content section. I'm not going to waste a lot of time going over that. <clears throat> the particulars are: we have five lecture exams and a final exam. Each one's worth 100 points or 600 points total. 90% of 600 is 540. If you earn 540 points, you um, get an A. Simple as that. Um, anything less than that, you'll get a B. But it just depends on, you know, where you fall. You know, if, you know we don't curve. We don't do extra credit, but. You know, it depends on how close you are to that magic number of, of 90, you know, 89.5, you're going to get rolled over. So well, type of stuff. Okay. Uh, let's see what else, anything important in particular, we've got five people on the ground and about uh, 14 online. That's fine. <clears throat> we will be taking advantage of the anatomage table. Um, uh, this semester, and what we got here. And um, for those of you that will be Zooming, I'm going to have this connected to the computer so it'll show up on the screen. Um, okay, got almost a full house today. So, and let's see what else. Uh, you know, the textbook is the uh, OpenStax book uh, that's free. And if you want to buy a textbook, uh, buy a good used one, spend no more than $10 on it. Let's see what we have here. Yeah. Um, but I've got you marked. So don't worry about it. Probably, it's probably from your phone. So, okay. Now, let's see, is there anything I have to go over? We will have lab this afternoon, uh, one o'clock. We'll be talking about, the, we'll, we will do the endocrine system in lab in its entirety. Uh, and um, <clears throat> we'll be looking at the structures of that. So if you're, if you're in lab, um, plan if you're registered for lab plan to be there for that today. What anything else? 
See, because you've all had A and P one, so I don't feel like I have to go through a whole lot of stuff for you. Um, questions on anything? No questions? Well, someone's gonna have a question. So, uh, nursing, who's in nursing? Okay, three in nursing. You're, uh, I heard you say OTA, and you are sur <laughs> surgery. Okay, that's a, we got a good mix in here. Uh, the AP1 class that was in here first this morning uh, was only about 50% nursing instead of about 80%. I had a, so it had a good mix of everything except um, uh, respiratory therapy, one respiratory therapy person, which was unusual. So uh, anyway, I can't think of uh, anything of relevance. The practice exams are already open for you for the for the AP2 lecture exams. Uh, the dates are not set as always for the lecture exams. We'll get to them when we get to them. The lab exams uh, are set uh, in stone, sorta, and the schedule is already posted for that. It's in eLearn. It's on the bulletin board there and at the other end of the hall. And um, we'll just. Go ahead and unless there's a question on anything, we're going to go ahead and start in the endocrine system. Okay. And those of you that are on Zoom, let me know if you can see the slides changing. I had a problem in the AP1 class about the slides not tracking. So you should see the slide that has a, the endocrine system with the various structures on there. Okay. The endocrine system is our other control system. The endocrine system is the counterpart to the nervous system. You know all about the nervous system. You learned all about the nervous system in AP1. Nervous system is the instantaneous control mechanism our bodies use. Everything is very, very rapid, 300 miles an hour to go, you know, uh, three feet. So the control is, is to us instant. Endocrine system is different. Endocrine system is slower. It's longer lasting. It's the counterpart to the nervous system. It's the other control mechanism, except that its, its effects are not instantaneous. They're slower. If you were to eat a donut or an apple and see your blood glucose levels rise a little bit, and your pancreas would release insulin. And that would bring your blood glucose levels back down to where they're supposed to be by opening up the um, channels um, uh, in, in the cell membranes of our body to let the glucose go into the cells. That takes time. It takes time measured in minutes. It's not instantaneous. So I got two comments. You only see the opening slide. Okay, let me try. Okay, so, okay, let me see if I can fix that. Okay. Let's erase. I'm going to stop sharing and go back here to this share screen. Okay. And try this. Okay. Here everybody sees the opening slide that says eight, chapter 17. Does everybody now does did the slide change? Yes, great. Okay, thank you. So let's see if it changes again. Okay, everybody see the new slide? I'm gonna assume it's working after this. Good, okay, then we are good to go. Now, the nervous, okay, so here we see, it's only been four months since I used Zoom the last time, man, so if you want, give me a break. Okay, the nervous system is instantaneous. The endocrine system is slow but it is slow to the point that it will last for years. Yes, it takes time for insulin to get released from the pancreas and go through the body 
and tell all the glucose to go into the cells. That takes about 10 to 20 minutes. You eat an apple or a donut, um, doesn't matter. Both contain glucose and your blood glucose levels rise. Your insulin gets, that gets detected. The insulin uh, gets released, is produced and released from the pancreas. It circulates throughout the body and opens up the channel proteins in all the cells to allow glucose to enter the cells. 20 minutes after you ate the apple or the, bana or the banana or the donut, your blood sugar is back where it belongs. Now, that takes time. Some of the effects are really long lasting. The effects of the ovaries releasing estrogen are gonna start at puberty and stop at menopause. That's about 40 years of action. In a male, you're gonna release testosterone starting at puberty and stop releasing testos testosterone when the male dies, 70, 80, 90 years later. So that's long duration activity. So the nervous system uses electrical signals, uses electrical signals to go send action potentials, term probably didn't take you here again, <clears throat> but I decided to get it out of the way. Um, send action potentials down the axons, connecting to another neuron or to a gland or a muscle or something else, uh, and it's instantaneous. The endocrine system uses what we call hormones. They are chemical messengers, and these hormones do things. Insulin is a hormone. Insulin works by telling cells to open up channel proteins to let glucose come in. So um, <clears throat> the uh, glucagon, which is the antagonist of insulin, glucagon allows glucose to be released from cells instead of coming in. So the, these, these uh, hormones are chemical signals telling us to do something. And it works as long as there's a receptor for us. So, so nervous system, electrical, endocrine system, chemical. Nervous system fast, endocrine slow. Nervous system instantaneous, endocrine system long duration. So, the hormones are the, the signals, the chemical messengers. And I guess the definition of a hormone is a chemical messenger because all different types of hormones, you know, insulin's one of them. Thyroid hormone controls our metabolic activity in the cells, controls the rate of cellular respiration in the cells. That's a hormone. The sex hormones, determine the secondary sex characteristics as well as the maturation of the ovaries and, and the uh, eggs and the production of sperm cells uh, in, in the uh, testes. So they all do different things as long as there are receptor sites to activate, to, to work. Endocrinology is what we call this field where you're studying the role of these hormones. You know, an endocrinologist works with a person that would have some sort of chemical imbalance. So, so the things that the endocrine system controls is reproduction. The sex hormones control reproduction. Growth and development. We have growth hormone. Clever name. Um, growth hormone is what is triggered at puberty so that we go, we achieve our adult stature. We achieve our adult body, that we become capable of, you know, reproduction, among other things. Uh, we maintain our fluid levels. We maintain our electrolytes, our salts, and our ion levels. We maintain our sugar levels in our bodies. Insulin and glucagon regulate blood glucose. You know, we don't have enough blood glucose, we can um, release glucagon to stimulate glucose relief. Glucagon causes our, our, our liver to release glucose. If we have too much glucose, our pancreas releases insulin so that glucose can go in the cells. 
And again, cellular metabolism, that's thyroid hormone and body defenses. The, we, um, we use our hormones to re help regulate and protect our, uh, our body. Now, how do we do that? Well, I'll show you here in a second. Now, okay, chemical messengers, the hormones, they travel throughout the body in the blood or in the lymphatic fluid. They can circulate everywhere. But when they circulate, they are looking for a receptor site. Do yeah. you ever wonder how if you take uh, Tylenol or Advil or aspirin or anything like that, how it knows where to work? It doesn't. It doesn't know where it's going to work. It only goes to where there is inflammation. I mean, it circulates throughout the body. The only place is Advil, for example. Advil is an anti-inflammatory, just like aspirin is. Advil works against in inflammation in our body. So if you have inflammation, if you have a, you know, your back is sore or your ankle is sore or something like that, you've done something, the infl it's, it's inflamed, there's increased blood flow there, uh, the Advil will work to correct that. Tylenol only works to block pain signals. Wherever there's a pain signal in our bodies, Tylenol will, work, will, will block it. Doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't know where to go. Hormones don't know where to go either. They circulate throughout our body. What tells them where to act is where they have receptor sites. There are cells with receptor sites on there, like a little plug that the hormone will, will stick into and act. For example, thyroid hormone has a receptor on every cell telling us to pick up the pace of our metabolic activity. So thyroid hormone can land on a cell and say, okay, I'm gonna work faster. Insulin has a receptor site in every cell to say, hey, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna suck in this sugar so our, our blood glucose levels are normal and I can use this sugar for energy. Thyroid stimulating hormone, sort of a ringer here. Thyroid stimulating hormone only acts in one place. Anyone my guess? Thyroid, yeah. The thyroid stimulating hormone lands only on, lands in the thyroid. Now it will come in contact with every cell in our body, but the only place it works is on the thyroid. That's why they call it thyroid stimulating hormone. It doesn't work anywhere else. It only works there. So, because that's the only place there are receptor sites. The hormones have to have a receptor. It's like a lock and a key. You know, the hormone is the key and it's looking for the right lock. You know, we go out in the parking lot and you press your key fob and hopefully your car is the only one that lights up, you know, because that's the only one that receives the signal. You begin to worry if you press your button and four or five cars all light up at the same time. So, so hormones. Now there's another term here called autocrines. Autocrines are sort of like wannabe hormones. The, the jury is still out as to whether or not they are a hormone. Autocrines are going to be chemicals that a cell releases that act on that cell. So a cell releases it and it acts on itself. So, um, for example, if um, the heart, if the pressure in the heart goes up, the heart can release a chemical called ANP. ANP causes the heart to slow down and relax its pressure. It acts on itself. That would be an autocrine. A paracrine, is another type of messenger that may or may not be considered a hormone. Paracrines are re released locally, but they act on other cells. We've got some examples of this here. Um, what they, what, uh, of an example for this. So they go back and forth every year. Are they hormones or are they not? 
we know that things like insulin and glucagon and epinephrine um, and thyroid hormone are all hormones, whether or not these autocrines and paracrines are hormones, it changes every year. So, okay. Hormones get released by endocrine glands. They are ductless glands. They don't have a tube. You know, mammary glands have ducts. Sweat glands have ducts. Um, all glands, sebaceous glands have ducts, but the endocrine glands don't. They dump their contents right into the blood supply or into the lymphatic fluid, and that stuff, the hormone, will circulate everywhere. The only place it works, though, is where there's a receptor site. Everything else will just bounce off of it and keep on going. The endocrine glands include the pituitary gland, what we call the master gland of the body, the thyroid gland, the parathyroid gland, the adrenal glands, the pineal gland, the thymus gland, the pancreas, the gonads, the ovaries and test testes, all of these are either endocrine glands or have endocrine functions. The pancreas is not a pure endocrine gland because half of it is endocrine and the other half is exocrine. The other half of the pancreas works by digesting protein for us. The um, ovaries and testes are not pure endocrine because the ovaries are busy making eggs and the testes are busy making sperm. And yet they're also producing estrogen and testosterone. Now, there, the link, but there is a link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. That is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus connects to the thalamus in our brain. Now, if you remember, the thalamus is the center of the brain where all sensory input comes in to get sorted. We sort it out at the thalamus. Now, the hypothalamus connects to the pituitary gland. And so the link between the thalamus and the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, that's the connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system right there. Now, there are other areas in our bodies that have endocrine functions. The uh, kidneys produce erythropoietin. Erythropoietin stimulates red cell production in the muscles. Renin helps to regulate fluid levels uh, in our filtrate. The heart, I mentioned already, the, the ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, regulates the contraction force if, if the blood pressure is getting too high. So there's a lot, a wide variety of hormones here. So here's where everything's located. Pineal gland in, is in the back of the brain, uh, sets right above <clears throat> the uh, cerebellum, um, right, right below the occipital lobe, just above the cerebellum. The pineal gland helps to regulate our sleep cycles. It's where we release a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin uh, controls our day-night cycles. The hypothalamus sits right in front of the thalamus, uh, and it regulates, um, the, it's the connection between the pituitary gland Pituitary gland hangs down below the, cere the cerebral hemispheres. <coughs> it um, is the master gland of the body because it produces six different hormones and releases two others, most of which have an effect on other glands. The parathyroid glands and the thyroid glands are located in the neck. The thyroid gland releases thyroid hormone, which, really, which controls metabolic activity. The parathyroid glands control our levels of uh, calcium in our blood. Thymus gland, we use that to mature our white cells to fight infection. The thymus gland is where all white blood cells, of, there's two types of white blood cells, B cells and T cells. The T cells all go to the thymus. They call them T cells because they go to the thymus gland. 
they are the infection fighters. They are the killer cells that protect us. They become what we say immunocompetent in the thymus land in our first year of life. And they are the only ones that can hunt down bacteria or pathogens and destroy them. The B cells make antibodies for us to fight infections. The B cells mature in our bone marrow, but the thymus gland has an important role there. When we are infants, our thymus gland is huge. By the time we're an adult, our thymus gland shrivels up to, you know, about the size of our little finger. The adrenal glands sits on top of the kidneys. The adrenal glands regulate our fluid and electrolyte levels. They also help to regulate our glucose levels and they um, stimulate our secondary sex characteristics and uh, development of, of the sex hormones. Internally, the, the adrenal glands release epinephrine and norepinephrine for us. And of course the pancreas then stimulates the release of insulin uh, for us. And then of course there's the ovaries and testes and releasing test testosterone or estrogen. So. so for a hormone to work, I've said this already, they have that land on a cell with a receptor site. We call them target cells. <clears throat> so the target cell has a receptor site. Now, in, for some hormones, every cell may be a target cell. Thyroid hormone lands on every cell. It tells every cell in our body what to do as far as metabolic activity. Thyroid stimulating hormone, the target cells are only located on, th on the thyroid gland. So it goes throughout the body, circulates all the way around, but the only place it finds target is right here. Remember that every hormone is going to circulate throughout the body through blood and through lymph, but it's only going to work where it finds a target cell with a receptor site. That's the only thing that it can do. And when it lands in the target cell, it can change the activity level of that cell. So what can it do? Well, insulin, for example, insulin creates channel um, creates uh, channel proteins in the cell membrane. I almost said channel membranes. Um, if you remember back in AP1, we talked about these various channels that go through the cell membranes, let in water and let in sodium and stuff like that. And some are just plain old tubes that let water in. Some are gated and some are electrical. Well, what insulin does is open, is creates a whole series of ion channels, protein channels in the cell membrane to allow glucose to come in. And so if insulin isn't present, the cell can't make these channel proteins or carrier proteins. And with, without these, pro, these channels, glucose doesn't enter the cell, glucose stays in the blood. So our blood glucose levels stay elevated. It's the presence of glucose sugar in the blood that triggers the release of insulin. Now, if not enough insulin is available, we don't make the channel proteins and let glucose go into the cell. If the insulin isn't recognized, we don't make the channel proteins and glucose doesn't go into the cell. In either case, our blood sugar levels stay elevated. And so this is the role of, you know, of, you know the, the, this is how insulin works. It creates, it allows the cell to make these channel proteins. So hormones can also increase protein synthesis. Growth hormone allows us to grow. The presence of growth hormone allows us to reach our adult stature by stimulating protein synthesis so that we lay down, our, our bones get bigger, our muscles enlarge, we generate more bone, bone cells, uh, our muscles, in, you know, we don't make new muscle cells, but they can increase in size. Um, we can make all sorts of other proteins that we need. We can turn on or turn off enzymes. 
We can turn on or turn off enzymes. You know, we can um, break down uh, amylase. We can release amylase in our mouth to break down sugar, or we can stop it. We can secrete other, other chemicals. For example, if we release um, growth hormone, it stimulates protein synthesis. However, if we release, um, it's, oh, here's a good one. Uh, what we call follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone, and don't worry about these because you're going to hear about them in detail later on. Follicle stimulating hormone acts on the ovaries and the testes to cause the maturation of eggs and sperm. If we release luteinizing hormone from the pituitary gland, it acts on the ovaries and testes to make estrogen and testosterone. So we start secreting this activity and we can stimulate mitosis with hormones. Now there are two types of hormones. They're either going to be based off of amino acids or they're going to be based off steroids. Steroids are the easiest, they're cholesterols. You know, they are, the sex hormones are all steroid based and they're very easy. They slide right into the cell. Yeah, because they're fat soluble. Remember, the cell membrane is a, a lipoprotein membrane with that squiggly layer of the, the phospholipids that are arrayed with their little tails sticking in towards the middle and they're squishy and they move up and down. Well, steroids are, are oily, they slide right through. The sex hormones, test, testosterone and estrogen, slide through the membrane. The hormones from the adrenal glands, from the cortex, the outer layer of the adrenal glands, um, all slide across the cell membranes. They're very, very easy. So unfortunately, most of the hormones that we have are amino acid based. They're large. They're, <clears throat> um, they're too large to slide through the, um, the membrane. So now, Thyroid hormone doesn't have that problem. For some reason, thyroid hormone can slide through anyway. But all the other hormones can't get in because they're too big. If it's based off of amino acids, they're too big. So it's because they're all water soluble, except thyroid hormone. So if you are a large hormone, you can't get into, and you're an amino acid hormone, if you're soluble in water, you can't get into the cell. <clears throat> you have to use something known as a second messenger. Second messenger is called a G protein second messenger. And there are two types of second messengers, cyclic AMP and the PIP calcium. And don't worry, it gets a whole lot better after this. I'm just getting the, I'm getting the ugly stuff out of the way first. So. Okay, cyclic AMP, hormones too big to get in. This was discovered with epinephrine. Epinephrine is a hormone. It comes out of the, the, the medulla of the adrenal gland. Epinephrine can't get into cells. It can land on the cell membrane, but it can't get in. What it does though, is it turns on what we call the, a G protein. The G protein turns on an enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase then becomes these, um, activates ATP and converts it to cyclic AMP, which is the second messenger. The second messenger then turns on enzymes inside the cell to do whatever it's supposed to do. It's like epinephrine, for example. Epinephrine will raise our heart rate. It will increase our breathing rate. Um, it will, you know, it can cause all sorts of 
excitatory responses in our bodies, but it only does it if it can tell the cell what to do. Now, this is a much easier way to look at it. The first messenger up there, the little orange thing is epinephrine. It lands on a receptor site in the cell membrane, activates the G protein, which activates the adenyl cyclase to make cyclic AMP inside the cell. And it tells the cell to make enzymes to do something, whatever it is. So what do you have to remember out of this? Cyclic AMP is one of the two big second messengers. Why do we care? That's a good question. We care because this is how the, the large hormones get their information into the cell. Because, you know, and from a healthcare perspective, that's going to be important to understand, you know, because there's all sorts of issues that can happen at the cellular level here. We gotta, we, this is important to us because we want to make sure <clears throat> when a patient's receiving some sort of therapeutic action, that it's going to work. So, yeah. The other second messenger is known as PIP calcium. Instead of uh, adenylate cyclase, we use something called phospholipase C. We end up with <coughs> um, phospholipase C breaks a protein in half into what's known as diaglycerol and inositol triphosphate, or what we say IP3. Now, why is that important? Well, the diaglycerol does the same thing as the C amp did. It turns on the protein kinases. The IP3 causes a release of calcium. Calcium does things for us. Calcium allows us. Uh, uh, neurotransmitters to get released at the end of an, of an axon terminal. Calcium allows uh, mu heart muscle to contract faster. Uh, so cal calcium is pretty important to us. So we, we see two different types of second messengers here. The uh, cyclic AMP for epinephrine and the PIP calcium for um, releasing uh, this protein called calmodulin that uses calcium for other activities. We're going to get into those a little as we go further along. Okay. And I already mentioned this about uh, if you are a lipid soluble, a fat soluble, a steroid based hormone, then you go right into the cell and act directly on the DNA. So, like this. You actually get into the DNA and alter the DNA of a cell telling it what to do. You know, it's like you know, stimulating uh, you know, production of testy, uh, testosterone or estrogen or stimulating egg release or uh, sperm production or development of the secondary sex characteristics. Okay. And just because we can't leave it out, insulin doesn't use second messengers. Insulin is pretty important to us, so it regulates our blood sugar levels or blood glucose levels. I'm going to try to start saying, now that we're in AP2, I'm going to switch from try to switch from blood glucose to, I mean, from blood sugar to blood glucose because that's how you'll say it in a professional setting. Insulin doesn't use a second messenger. It um, uses a receptor called tyrosine kinase. And this is what, this receptor is what stimulates the opening of the various uh, channel proteins to let glucose come into the cell. And it is the failure of producing these channel membranes that is the root cause of diabetes. You know, either the insulin's not working right or the insulin isn't there in sufficient quantities. So, okay. So let's, let's move on to something a little more interesting here now. Target cells. Target cells have specific receptors, like I said, like the lock and key approach. The, um, 
there are very some hormones are very specific. Um, the um, ACTH receptors for adrenocorticotropic hormone. <coughs> ACTH is a hormone released by the pituitary gland, telling the adrenal cortex, the outer la outer layer of the adrenal gland, to do something. Now the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, the outer covering releases three different types of hormones. The instructions on how to act may come from, are going to come from the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland releases ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH circulates throughout the whole body. Circulates throughout the whole body, but only finds receptor sites on um, the adrenal cortex tells the adrenal cortex to turn on and do something. Do we want to release a certain type of hormone? And the instructions should be there, but it will only work there. Thyroxin, thyroid hormone. Every cell in our body has a receptor site for thyroid hormone. And so every cell in our body is going to respond to that thyroid hormone stimulus. So we have to have specific receptors. You can have your cells are covered with receptors for different types of hormones. Some cells have have like every cell has thyroid hormone. Not every cell is going to have a receptor for um, the, that adrenocorticotropic hormone. Okay. So why doesn't insulin work anymore in some patients? There's two types of diabetes. Uh, type one, which is uh, juvenile diabetes, uh, you know, that uh, is acquired through um, some sort of um, autoimmune disorder. Usually, the, the conventional thinking is it's an autoimmune disorder which attacks the pancreas and destroys the pancreas's ability to create insulin. And so, somewhere along the way, uh, an individual somewhere in their preteen years or their adolescent years. Um, has some event which called, tells the pancreas to stop producing insulin or to stop having the ability to make insulin. And they, the onset there is uh, <coughs> type 1 diabetes or diabetes mellitus type 1, juvenile diabetes. The other type of diabetes is adult onset type 2. You know, it usually shows up in an individual about 40 years old uh, significantly overweight and under-exercised. Um, you know, the pancreas has been asked for years and years to produce lots of insulin. And it has always responded. The cells reach a point where they no longer recognize that insulin. So we have, you know, for a cell to work, it has to recognize its hormone. And in the case of type two diabetes, adult onset diabetes, the cell has been exposed to insulin so long and at such high quantities, it's like, bless you. The cell says, no more, I'm not gonna do it. No. Target cells will work to a point. Now for a target cell to work, we gotta have adequate numbers, adequate levels of the hormone in the blood. <coughs> bless you. Gotta have adequate, can do it again? In a minute. Okay. <laughs> so, my wife sneezes four times in a row. That's right. And I always say, that's three. And I wait for the fourth one. So, anyway, so we regulate, you know, our hormones. Do we have enough in the blood? Okay, healthy individual with no issues with uh, diabetes. Uh, if they eat whatever they eat, something with carbohydrates in there, they're going to release a certain amount of insulin, and that's going to tell the cells to let the glucose come into the cell. Okay. How many receptors do they have? Do they have an adequate number of receptors or not? First thing for a hormone to work, is there enough hormone? Are there enough receptor sites? And are the receptors going to have enough affinity to receive those hormones? Cells are funny. 
they can regulate their response to a hormone. They have what's known as upregulation. If you're only releasing a little bit of a hormone, many cells can increase the number of their receptors. An individual that has type one diabetes, it is likely that before, as the individual progresses through the, the destruction of the, um, the islets of Langerhans where the insulin is produced in, in the pancreas, as, they, as, they, as the cells are being destroyed uh, through the autoimmune response for whatever reason, um, the target cells, which are all of our cells, are likely trying to produce more receptor sites so they can, you know, as the insulin levels drop, target cells are producing more receptors to try and grab as much insulin as they can. So one way our, our bodies can respond to less hormone is to make more receptors so that they keep a constant level of stimulation. Now, downregulation is usually what's happening in type two diabetes. The cells get tired of saying, hey, I'm, no, no more, no more because they've been exposed to so much insulin for so long, they start reducing the number of receptor sites they have available. So in type two diabetes, your pancreas is busy churning out lots of insulin, but it's not being recognized. The insulin's not being recognized at the target site. So down regulation of the, of the, uh, of the target cells all the cell, many of the cells in our bodies when we're exposed to lots of insulin say, hey, enough's enough. And so they downregulate. They stop producing as many receptors. This is upregulation. Here we see in the left, hormone levels normal, whatever normal is. We have a normal number of, a normal amount of hormone and a no, no, normal amount of receptors. If the hormone level drops for whatever reason, the cell can respond by making more receptors. So, you know, if, if we are producing half as much, yes. Sorry, um, I just have a question. So I sure. have a lot of bacteria. Oh, that's okay. Um, so we were talking about diabetes just now, and I know that sometimes in pregnant women, they get um, diabetes, and I know that sometimes it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's referred to as gestational diabetes. Right. Okay, what happens is the individual um, is producing lots of glucose uh, to, to send, to, see, glucose can go across the placenta uh, to the baby. The, um, and the blood doesn't mix, but the glucose goes over. Uh, the, the, the pregnant mother only needs to eat about a third as much more, you know, the old wives tell about eating for two, not really true. Uh, and so what will happen it, though is that uh, if she, she is sending her glucose to the baby, then she will stimulate other glucose production in her body. She will start breaking down her fats um, to try and give herself more glucose. And what, what can happen is that she can maintain her glucose levels, they can get too high. And so once delivery, you know, once the baby's born, um, you know, she may not be able to respond to, you know, you know she may have produced so much glucose that um, she is in a, in a down regulation state there, you know. Now, most pregnant women that have uh, gestational diabetes, it reverses. Sometimes it doesn't. So uh, it, it, it's supposed to. There's no guarantees on that. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Upregulation, we don't get enough hormone. You know, and we don't know this. We may, you know, if it's still, if everything is still working fine, how do we know there's a problem? You know, the only way we would know there's a problem here is if we had some sort of blood screen to determine our levels of. Uh, uh, so. The only way we would know that there's a problem is if we had some sort of screen to detect what our, our hormone level is. Because if, if our cells are responding by making more receptors, you never know. 
If everything's still working fine, we would never notice a problem. And so uh, this is upregulation. And it may just be a temporary thing. You may not be producing as much hormone at a time. Um, and so we create more receptors. You know, perhaps this may occur in your in your older female, as you know, your postmenopausal female, her ovaries may shut down somewhere. Oh, I don't know, you know, um, 50, 40, you know, anywhere from 40 on could be this onset of menopause. And we'll just keep a nice big number there. And it may be as that she is reducing, producing less and less um, estrogen, her target cells may be making more and more receptor sites until she finally uh, shuts down. Because, you know, because menopause starts, menopause is defined, I guess it's a, a whole year without a, uh, uh, a period, it's 12 months without having any kind of uh, uh, menstrual flow. So, uh, so you wouldn't know that, you know, in, you don't know what the, the hormone levels are as they're dropping because the, the cells may respond by creating more receptors. Downregulation, sometimes no, that's a different situation. You know, there's our on the left, there's our normal hormone level, really uh, orange dots, and normal receptors. But if we increase the hormone levels, like for example, with uh, insulin, you know. <clears throat> an individual that maintains a high carbohydrate, high fat diet is going to be demanding more insulin out of their pancreas. And so the pancreas produces lots of insulin. Blood sugars are up. And the, re the receptor cells may say, oh, no, I don't like this. And so they may, what they will do is say, we will have reduced uh, receptors. The idea of the, reducing the number of receptors is to try and keep the stimulus level the same. However, what usually happens in type two diabetes is that we reduce the receptors to the point where there's literally no response. Because in type two diabetes, the, the pancreas is working just fine producing insulin, but the target cells, most of the cells of our body aren't recognizing that insulin. It's the same insulin. There's just too much of it now. And so we said, I'm not going there. Because you know, it'll, but you know that in, in many cases, in most cases, when an individual loses a sufficient amount of weight, what happens? A type two diabetes patient, significantly overweight. They lose a lot of weight over time. What happens with their type two diabetes? Any guesses? Increases. It, it goes away, actually. The uh, many people, particularly ones, that, and not because of the surgery, but ones that have the gastric bypass and surgical intervention for the weight loss, they will no, they will report that their type two diabetes goes away in weeks uh, because there's uh, they're no longer in taking in vast quantities of uh, carbs. And, and fats. And a person who loses weight uh, without any kind of intervention also sees the same thing. As, as the amount of insulin gets, gets produced, it drops. As the demand for insulin drops because the, the amount of carbohydrates and fats that are coming in drops, then the receptor sites start being stimulated again. And so an individual that goes through a significant weight, an individual with type two diabetes can revert, can in many cases reverse that by simply losing weight and not having to go into, you know, having some sort of synthetic hormone insulin injection and stuff like that. So, uh -oh. okay. And that's something, you know, you talk, you talk to your patients about too in, in healthcare about, um, you know, you know, we always hear this diet and exercise. Diet and exercise sounds so incredibly boring, um, but it works. You know, it's the simplest approach to get there. You know, um, most of our patients in East Tennessee, 
I don't know. Many of our patients in East Tennessee have underlying health conditions. You know, you know, we're in the top 10 in the nation for diabetes and for obesity and for heart disease, you know, and whatever else, throw a couple of things in there. I mean, it does guarantee our full employment, but uh, in healthcare, so. But that would be sarcastic to say that, so I won't say it. Okay. Hormones don't act indefinitely. They have a short time period with which to act. They have what's known as a half-life. How long will it take it to break down in, you know, to, to its uh, effect is half of what it was. And just like in, in dealing with radioactive material, and there's no radiation involved with uh, hormones, but its activity level is cut in half. And it can be in seconds to minutes to hours. Enzymes break it down, the kidneys break it down. They don't stay there. The hormones don't stay active forever. So, and we wouldn't want them to because if they ever kept stimulating the cells, that could create all sorts of bad situations. So, 10 seconds. 10 seconds is how long a hormone can usually act. Um, some of the, you know, the more immediate responses. Uh, of course, uh, in, in, in nervous system time, 10 seconds is, is practically, you know, an, an eternity. But in <clears throat> dealing with hormones, 10 seconds is pretty quick. Uh, but then again, other hormones are going to take hours, days, weeks, months, years. Um, it just depends on the type of hormone, how long it's going to be active. The thing to remember though with hormones, is all of our hormones control activity in our body through negative feedback. If you remember from AP1, negative feedback is when we, we respond to a stimulus by reversing the stimulus. If we get hot, we sweat to cool down. If we get cold, we shiver to warm up. If our blood sugar goes up, we get released insulin to bring it back down. Negative feedback always reverses the stimulus. And so that's what, that's how we control um, the levels of, of, of hormones in our blood. Now, what turns on the hormones? What causes the stimulus? Well, there's three different ways that we can stimulate the release of a hormone. We have what's known as humoral stimulus. Blood calcium levels go up. We're breaking down a lot of bone. Okay, if our blood calcium levels go, go up, it means that we've got either too much calcium in our diet or we're breaking down bone. So what do we do? Well, we respond to that by stimulating bone production, bone deposition. If, if glucose levels go up, what do we do? We release insulin to bring it down. That is a humoral stimulus. It involves the actual detection of an ion or a chemical in the blood. We, de we detect excess calcium. We detect excess glucose. Excess calcium, then we're going to release uh, calcitonin from the uh, thyroid gland to increase bone deposition. If we have too much insulin, I mean too much glucose, we're going to release insulin. That's this is all humoral stimulus. Neural stimulus deals with the nervous system telling us to do something. When we go, when we experience a fight or flight response, remember fight or flight, you know. Um, stand and fight or run away, one or the other, uh, or stand there and process and, and keep processing. Um, that's a nervous system response to something going on around us. The adrenal medulla is stimulated 
by the nervous system to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. You know, uh, the fire alarm goes off and we all smell smoke. And so we decide we better evacuate the building. Oh, by the way, if we do have to evacuate the building, we go out into the soccer field. They've changed the rules again. So now we go back into the soccer field. Slides are a little out there. So well, I wish that wasn't recorded. Anyway, um, the, um, we were exposed to a fight or flight response. You know, we almost hit a deer in the way home or someone almost hits us in the way home or maybe somebody does hit us at an intersection. You know, and um, just because they had blue lights in the car didn't mean they could run the light, you know. Um, fight or flight response. We release a lot of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla, thanks to what our nervous system is telling us to do. That's a neural stimulus. And the third, third response is hormonal. The hypothalamus tells the pituitary gland to do something. If the hypothalamus detects that our thyroid hormone levels are too low in our bodies, because the hypothalamus is watching all that stuff, because remember, it's connected to the thalamus. And the thalamus gets all the sensory input from the whole body. <clears throat> if, the, if the hypothalamus is told, it detects that our, our thyroid hormone levels are too low, it will tell the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. That is a hormonal stimulus. And it will do so, the hypothalamus will release thyroid stimulating hormone to act on the thyroid gland. It will tell the, it, the hypothalamus will tell the pituitary gland, make more thyroid stimulating hormone, which acts on the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone. So that is a hormonal response. We, the hypothalamus detects that thyroid hormone levels are low and it tells the pituitary make more thyroid stimulating hormone, which tells the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone and it brings it back up and the hypothalamus then is happy. So, and so many of us are visual. This is a good illustration here. Here's the humoral stimulus on the left. Calcium levels are too low or too high depending on what they are. If calcium level is uh, too low, we stimulate parathyroid hormone in the parathyroid gland. If it's too high, we stimulate, uh, release a calcitonin from the thyroid gland. And we, uh, if it's too high, we lay down more bone. If it's too low, we break some bone down. The neural stimulus, the central nervous system acts on the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine. And the hormonal stimulus, there's the hypothalamus telling the pituitary gland to make more thyroid stimulating hormone to tell the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. Okay. Now these hormones don't operate in a vacuum. Some of these a lot of these hormones work together. We have three types of interaction. We have permissiveness, where one hormone requires the presence of another one to work with it. In um, or when well, let me back up. When we hit puberty, when we hit puberty and the sex hormones are being released in large quantities. We are going through um, development of all of our secondary sexual characteristics. We also need the thyroid hormone to be very active at that point because a lot of energy is required for us to go through the phys physical and physiological changes in our bodies. You know, all that growth that the reproductive hormones, testosterone or the estrogen are demanding in our bodies needs energy. And we gotta have the thyroid hormone there to stimulate metabolic activity <coughs> to make that energy available. So when we went through puberty, 
our appetite probably went way up. We, you know, we were, we ate a lot more. It's not uncommon to see a, a big uptick in appetite during puberty because we're trying to, to supply the energy needs of, you know, uh, secondary sexual development and, you know, and growth. Now, what about a synergistic response? A synergism is where we amplify a signal. You know, synergism, you could define it as saying one plus one equals three, where the result, the sum of the response is greater than the individual sums. Synergistic response. A person, uh, if a person's blood glucose levels are low, they will likely release glucagon, which causes the liver to release. Um, glucagon causes the liver to break down gluco, uh, glycogen and release it as glucose. And so blood glucose goes up and we get the glucose going into the cells. That is a, um, you know, that's you know, a, a one type of, that's, that's one, uh, one hormone causing a, a spike in blood glucose levels, glucagon. Now, epinephrine also tells the liver to break down glycogen to release glucose. Now, during a fight or flight response, both gluca uh, glucagon and epinephrine are released at the same time. So instead of the amount of glucose released from the glycogen and the amount of glucose released from the epinephrine, it isn't an additive response. We get a bigger spike during a fight or flight response by the combined effect of the glucagon and the epinephrine. During the fight or flight response, why do we need glucose? Energy, thank you. It's energy. We're going to use that energy for whatever our, whatever our response is going to be. Are we going to stand and fight? Are we going to run away? Are we going to do amazing things? Or are we just going to stand there? You know, because many people are. You know, there's all sorts of anecdotal evidence of individuals doing amazing physical activities in a fight or flight response, picking cars up off of, of people and stuff like that. You know, it, it just it happens. You know, and they're not aware of it. If nothing else, when we go through a fight or flight response, we're usually exhausted afterwards, regardless of what it is, because we've had this surge of glucose and then we crash afterwards. You know, it, it's sort of like you eat six donuts and then you crash afterwards, you know, um, because all this glucose got released together from both glucagon and the epinephrine together they give you a greater surge of glucose than you have gotten from either one individually. So that is a synergistic response where the two give you a combined result greater than the individuals. Now antagonistic, the third response is where one hormone works against the other. Classic example here is insulin and glucagon. Insulin lowers blood glucose levels by opening up channel proteins in the cell membranes and lets glucose come into the cell. Glucagon raises blood glucose levels by telling the liver to break down glycogen and release glucose into, into the blood. So one lowers blood glucose levels, one raises blood glucose levels. If you eat a donut or a banana or an apple, you're gonna see your blood glucose go up and insulin's gonna come out and put, put the glucose into the cells where they need it. If you didn't eat anything today, you came, you were so excited to come to class on the first day of class that you forgot to eat. You know, it could happen, maybe. Okay, unlikely, but it could still happen. You forgot to eat and your blood glucose levels drop. So your body's response is to release glucagon and glucagon acts on the liver and releases glucose and brings your blood glucose back up. It's not as satisfying as having something to eat, but it does bring your blood glucose back up to normal so that we can maintain, oh, I haven't said it yet for four months, homeostasis. So I promise not to say it again for a month. So, okay. Now, 
what are the um, major glands? Well, I, I went through them fairly quickly, but we'll just go through them again here. The pituitary gland, <clears throat> the master gland of the body. So it's right below the base of the brain, the, the cerebral hemispheres. The thyroid gland, right here in the neck. The parathyroid glands are on the back side of the thyroid. The adrenal glands set on top of the kidneys. The pancreas is over here, directly underneath the stomach. It's very squishy. The gonads, the ovaries and testes. The pineal gland dangles down behind the um, cerebral hemispheres, the occipital lobe, just above the cerebellum. If anybody remembers the corpora quadrigemina from uh, AP1 lab, you know, when you bent down the cerebellum, um, there was this little dangly thing uh, right between the two occipital lobes. That's the pineal gland. You'll see it this afternoon. And of course, the thymus gland right here in the neck. Okay. Pituitary gland, about the size and shape of a pea. It's attached by a little stalk called the infundibulum to the hypothalamus. <clears throat> Remember the cella tersica in bones, the Turk saddle in the, in the base of the skull, at the bottom of the skull? Somebody say yes, make me feel better. Yes. Thank you. Okay. That's where the pituitary gland is located. So it's right inside you, one of the most protected areas in the body. You know, it's nestled in that little depression there at the cella tersica. Uh, it has two parts. It has the posterior lobe and the anterior lobe. The posterior lobe is simply a storage facility. It will release two hormones. The hormones are stored there, but they're made in the hypothalamus. The anterior pituitary or the front part or what we call the adenohypophysis is glandular. It will make six different hormones and release them. So the hypothalamus controls all this, controls the pituitary gland. Uh, it can, the hypothalamus can um, direct the anterior pituitary to make hormones by sending out stimulating hormones. It can tell the anterior pituitary to stop making hormones by releasing um, inhibiting hormones. The um, hypothalamus also makes two hormones that it can store in the posterior pituitary. The, the two hormones that the hypothalamus makes are called oxytocin and uh, antidiuretic hormone. Oxytocin is what stimulates um, uterine contractions during pregnancy. It's also what stimulates milk release uh, when a baby is sucking on a nipple of, uh, of the breast to get milk to come out. Uh, Antidiuretic hormone is what tells us when to pee. Antidiuretic. A diuretic is a chemical that makes us pee. Antidiuretic is what restricts us from peeing. So antidiuretic, ADH, you're going to hear a lot about that over the course of the semester. So, so this is what the pituitary gland looks like. The anterior pituitary in the front is uh, filled with secretory cells to make all six different types of hormones. The posterior pituitary is simply storage. It's going to store oxytocin uh, and antidiuretic hormone. It does not make either one of those. It only stores those two. Okay. I've already said this. I'll say it again. Oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions. When the baby's head presses against the cervix, which is the opening uh, at the end of the uterus, and the baby has turned around and pressing his or her head against the cervix, that's going to be stimulating the release of oxytocin to enhance uterine contractions. The more the baby presses, the more oxytocin gets released, the more oxytocin gets released, the stronger the contractions are, it becomes a positive feedback loop in here. 
And for whatever reason, you might want to put a circle and a star around oxytocin uses the PIP calcium second messenger system. So I'll just throw it out there for, you know, frame of reference. Antidiuretic hormone, ADH, controls our water content. The hypothalamus monitors salt. Those are osmoreceptors in our water. If we get too salty, it's monitoring salt content in our plasma. If we get, to, now here, this is an interesting point here. If we get too salty, it's usually because we've lost water. The amount of, the actual amount of salt in our body stays pretty constant, but we can become more salty and less salty as we lose water. So if our salt concentration goes up, the hypothalamus will tell us to release more antidiuretic hormone so we don't pee away more water. Think about this on a hot day, you're outside, you know, you're, you're working outside doing something, you know, um, and it's hot and you're not drinking any water and you're sweating and you, um, are thirsty, but you've noted, you may notice that throughout the whole day that you worked outside, you didn't have any urge to pee because you're losing water, your salt concentration is going up. And so instead of uh, generating more urine, your kidneys are retaining water so that you can stay, try to stay at a, at a fairly normal level of salt. Because when you sweat, you lose water, you don't lose salt. You don't lose a lot of salt anyway. So the hypothalamus is going to monitor our salt levels. If we get too salty, it's saying, hey, we're thirsty. We need more water. Stop peeing. That's essentially what happens. We stop peeing. Um, you know, the, um, <clears throat> if you ever go for a, go on a hike, you ever go up to Mount Lacan? Who's, who's done Anybody here? You know, one of the things they tell you uh, is if you're not peeing, you're not staying hydrated. You're not drinking enough water. Especially, you know, a, you know how it is you go to Lacan, you know, in the morning, you start out, it's nice and cool when you got all these sweaters and stuff on it. By the time you get up, you're like, ah, I'm burning up, you know. And your, your clothes are soaked because you've been sweating all the way up there. But they say if you're not peeing, then you're, you're not staying hydrated because you're, you're losing water, but you're not replacing it. So this is what antidiuretic hormone does for us. It allows us to hold our water level as much as back as much as we can without losing it. So, okay. And that is a great place to stop. So, okay. Anybody have any questions on anything? Yes. Uh, just the PowerPoints. Yeah, that's all. Because we're going to go look at the models, and we're going to look at the we're going to look at the structures of the of the uh, endocrine glands. So I've got a, a nice set of models to take a look at. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the question is yes. This is all going to go to YouTube uh, later today. So. Okay, good. So I'm going to get us out of here and. Uh, See you, I guess I'll see all of you in the lab, maybe. <laughs>